Welcome back to the show for business owners, your first thousand clients. I'm your host, Mitch Russo, and I've been an entrepreneur, business owner, corporate executive, venture capitalist, and company founder for the last 30 years. Henry Ford is attributed with the quote, nothing happens until someone sells something. Well, listeners, today you are in for a rare treat. A special guest graces our airwaves today. I first heard him speak in Boston in 1989 to a crowded stadium audience, and I've been listening to him ever since. His book, How to Master the Art of Selling, was my sales Bible all the years I was building my company. It became required reading for my sales staff, too. Today, he still consults and appears on stage, running his two-day sales academy all over the country. Welcome, Tom Hopkins, to the show. Well, thank you, Mitch. Nice to be back and joining you. Absolutely. Here you are back in Boston, and today we are in the middle of our third blizzard in a row. So if we make it through this and the power doesn't go out, we'll know that it was inspired by the heavens. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, Tom, one of the things that a lot of people don't really understand is the fact that you started just like the rest of us. You basically went through just like what we all do when we get started in our career. And I'd love to hear that story. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, sure. I uh, didn't go to college, Mitch, so I'm not a really what you call formal educated person. I went for 90 days and realized the academic setting wasn't for me, and I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And for a year, my uncle helped me go into construction carrying steel as an iron worker, which Just as a side note, it's the hardest physical labor on the planet. Hmm. And I did that for a year. And fortunately, my father, who was really disappointed when I quit college, he suggested that because I was pretty communicative and that I was now 18, that I get a real estate license. And so I said, well, dad, I'm not very smart. I don't know if I can pass that darn exam. And sure enough, I did fail the real estate exam three times. And the fourth time I got my license. And then I had a challenge, Mitch, because I was young, just about 19 now. And I didn't have a car. I only had a motorcycle. And I didn't have any dress clothes. And back then, we had a little dress culture to wear like in real estate, you should almost have a suit. And the owner of the company finally hired me. He said, if you show up Monday with a suit, and you can come to work. And I wanted to go into real estate and I wanted a guy to hire me. So I went to my closet and when I was 16, I played in a band and we saw the Beatles come in 1962 and they had these silver lame band uniforms. And so I had our band have those and it was silver, kind of shiny, and it had a velvet purple collar. And I showed up in the back of the office, drove my motorcycle to the back, walked in the back. Broker was there with 12 salespeople having a meeting, and I walked in and sheepishly was standing at the back, and he stopped the meeting. He says, hey, all of you listen up. The kid standing back there who drove up on a motorcycle and has that band uniform on, if he can make it, I expect all of you to get rich. And that's kind of the way he brought me in (laughs) to the company. And again, I didn't start off a super I, in six months, only made one little sale, and my savings from construction was running out. And I totally believe when your attitude is right, Mitch, that doors will open for people who have the right thinking, the right attitude. And that's kind of what happened to me. I was just about broke, and a man came into our office looking for homes to show He was a young guy, maybe 23 or 4, which he was young like me. I was 18. He was a real nice kid, a young man, and he had a beautiful car, beautiful clothes. And he suggested that I go see a man who back then was the real father of American selling. J. Douglas Edwards was his name. And I spent the last 150 bucks I just about had to my name to go and spend three days with him. And it was life-changing. It really was. And I became his student, as so many people have become my students of my training. And that's kind of, in a way, how all of a sudden I started learning what to say to people, how to show property better. And all of a sudden, I started making sales. The money started coming in. And lo and behold, 
I was on target out of 300 salespeople in the company to that year be the number one salesperson, which that was kind of a the how it all got started. Mm -hmm. And I did that for eight years, eight glorious years listing and selling properties. And then I was fortunate to write my book, How to Mass the Art of Selling. And then I had some doors open to where I was asked to speak. And that's kind of how my seminar career started. And that's what I do today. Just get on a plane almost every week, fly somewhere in the world and teach people this wonderful art form called professional selling. Well, Tom, there's probably very few people who have maintained a career on stage for as long as you have with the success that you have. And more importantly, the information that you are able to share with people is life-changing. It was for me, and it was for my team. Here's my question. When did you begin to realize that what you had was so different and so special that you needed to teach others? Well, it's amazing what happened. I had a year where everything came together, Mitch, and I sold 365 homes in a year. And my manager calls me in and says, Tom, I don't know if you're even counting, but that's averaging one home a day. And the National Association of Realtors heard that you were only 24 years of age and that you made this happen. 23, I'm sorry. And they want you to come and speak in Los Angeles at the National Convention. And I agreed to do it, scared to death. And I was only supposed to speak, Mitch, to about 100 people. You know, when you're a new speaker, you don't speak to the whole convention. But I showed up at eight when the convention kicked off and I was there in my suit and tie. And I wasn't supposed to speak until one o'clock. And suddenly the president of the association comes over. And he says, Tom, our featured speaker, who is a man named Thomas Peters, who was a best-selling author, he's caught in Los Angeles traffic, and we've got to get started. Can you go on? <laughs> and he then said, you'll only be able to speak till he shows up. So here I have no idea what to say. I have no lo- idea how long I'll be out there. But I walked out on that stage, and I just looked out at that 5,000 people. And I said, do most of you realize that the words you and your people are saying can be costing you thousands of dollars a year? And I quickly, I don't know how much time I have, but I'd love to give you 10 words you must eliminate from your company's vocabulary. And of course, when they heard that I'd sold that many homes, they were very attentive. They all pulled out business cards because we didn't have workbooks then. And they took my 10 words. And isn't it funny how fate is? I finished the 10th word after 12 minutes, and suddenly the president walked out and said, our speaker here, but what'd you think of this young guy? And I got a thunderous standing ovation and came back to my office, and my phone started ringing, Mitch. And every real estate board who'd been to that meeting, they were calling and asking me to come speak. And I couldn't at that point give my real estate career. I not only owned many properties, but I had a pretty good overhead. So it took me about two years of going out and speaking literally for free to not only learn the art form of speaking, but to start building my reputation when I then said it's time for me to give up selling and listing real estate and go full time to build my seminar business, my Champions Unlimited career in this business of seminars. That's quite a story, Tom, because here's the interesting part to me that I'm fascinated with is the fact that you never really tried to be a speaker. It was as if the universe conspired around you to lift you up and place you on that stage at exactly the right moment in time with the exact right 10 words to say that brought you to that point, right? I mean, it's amazing. A lot of things like that. The man who was my original trainer, J. Douglas Edwards, who really taught me how to close a sale, he was the guru back then of closing sales, I decided to leave California and move to Arizona. And I wrote him because I had his post office box address, letting him know I was coming to Arizona. I knew he lived there somewhere. And so I bought a home in Paradise Valley, Arizona, here in Scottsdale. And the day I'm moving in, I hear a voice I'd listened to for hundreds of hours, and it was Mr. Edwards, who 
walked into my garage when I'm unpacking our belongings to put in the home. And he walks in my garage and I was startled. (laughs) And I said, Mr. Edwards, what are you doing here? He said, I thought I'd welcome my new next door neighbor to the area. So there again, I bought a home right next door to a man I had no idea of the 4 million people in Arizona where he lived. But that's kind of another door where he then took me under his wing and taught me the art form of public speaking, handling an audience, and so forth. So all these doors happen. I truly believe that they were destined to happen. And I, of course, every day, thank God for all the wonderful things that's happened in my life to allow me to influence and in a positive way, help others have a better life. So it's been a real trip and a fabulous life. Absolutely. And some people listening to this might say, wow, he's a lucky guy. But I have found that luck follows those who are prepared and do the work leading right up to that moment. So I totally agree. So Tom, you didn't have to move to Scottsdale, but you chose to move near someone that you admired. And then the universe just steered you exactly into the right spot. People listening to this might also say, okay, well, I understand all that. How do I make that happen for me? What answer would you give those folks? Well, there's a bunch of things. First of all, I think you really need to be doing something that you have a passion for. Many years ago, I played golf with uh, Wayne Gretzky, who was the famous, of course, hockey player who changed hockey in our world. But I happened to live near him in California when I lived there, and I played golf with him. And I was going home with him in the car. I said, Wayne, you are the man that's changed hockey, number 99, the great one. What do you think the reason was? And he said, Tom, I had an overwhelming passion for all aspects of the sport of hockey. I had a passion for practice, a passion for winning, a passion for losing a passion for the fact that when I skated on the ice, all the other team players on the uh, team we were playing were after me, because if they stopped me, they would beat us. And he just overwhelmed me with enthusiasm about the importance of passion. So the first thing I would say to our listeners is, I think you have to be in a business, a career that you just don't like. You have to have an overwhelming passion to love what you do, which is true in my case. It's a highlight in my life to hear the comments that you've been so gracious to make and to receive the letters and have people come up and have the 50, 60, 70 year olds come in with their children who are in their 20s and 30s and bring them on the stage and say, yeah, 35 years ago, I was brand new in sales. I went to the year seminar and this is my son or daughter. They're going into the field and I dragged them here to have you do for them what you did for me. So these are the kind of things I think that are the wind beneath my wings as far as wanting me to continue as long as I am physically, emotionally able to be a teacher, motivator, trainer, and so forth. Listeners, we are talking to Mr. Tom Hopkins, sales trainer extraordinaire, who has educated me and tens of thousands of others in the art of selling. For every single word that Tom is saying today, you will find it at yourfirsttausandclients.com. Look for Tom Hopkins' show page. And on that page, every word that we have discussed today, every word that has been said is documented there along with every book, every article, everything we talk about is right there for you. Don't miss it if you're driving right now. Just go to yourfirsttausandclients.com. Tom, overwhelming passion for practice winning and losing is what makes a successful life. So if I heard you correctly, Tom, what you said is that if you don't have that passion, then you potentially may not make it. How about if you want to have the passion, but don't have it now? What would you do to get it? Well, first, I think you have to have the financial capacity to take a risk which what that means to me is you might have to give up what you've got to get what you want. Many times I'll have people that have nine to five jobs. They'll be referred to me and get advice. And I will always say to them, 
you can't really go through a change until you have the capital, the financial resources to take a risk. So I have a little rule of thumb that I did when I was young and started wanting to go into sales. I started saving X amount of money so that I could live almost for six months without having to make a dime, meaning all my bills would be paid. And when you have some capital in the bank and you can relax a little bit, that's when you can start the second part, which is research for something you love and are passionate about. Some people find insurance and financial services, and they fall in love with helping people in that way in their life. Others like myself, they love helping people get into homes and they go into real estate. But I think every city has a newspaper that is advertising or they have the internet where companies are drastically wanting people to look at their company and interview. So there's no challenge in finding good companies that want salespeople. But again, you have to have the capital to exist until the money comes in. You have to have a product you have passion for. And then you have to find someone who's a mentor that can actually help you train you, which, of course, is done today through CDs, through books, through videos. So there's no shortage of the knowledge and the expertise to develop yourself into the person you dream of and to reach the goals that you are burning on fire to achieve. All of that is so important, and I agree with you on every point. Here's the part that I run into as a coach and mentor to others. A lot of people don't believe that they can do it. Have you found that to be true? Yes, I had that challenge because really when I was young, uneducated, scared to death, had a low self-esteem in my own person. And here again, I think you have to work harder on yourself than you do on your job to increase your self-esteem, to become the person that you believe and want to dream about becoming. And I totally believe that if you will take the time to find mentors, I had basically two. I had Mr. Edwards, who taught me the art of selling. Then I had Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who his book, Think and Grow Rich, had such a powerful effect on me emotionally. So I think you have to go through the pain of change if you want to become a different person. And I think that begins by doing research. I have an extensive library. I think that you've got to study. I think that many people don't read books on self-improvement, which I think is a mistake. But what's wonderful about the world today, and we didn't have this back when I started, but you can turn your car into an actual classroom and every driving mile can be education and learning because you can listen to some of the great works. And if you go to Amazon, they have got all the DVDs, CDs, they have all the great ones. And there's many people out there that can change your life if you just take their instruction and apply it. I totally agree. And again, like you, I had my rolling university all throughout my sales careers. My whole trunk was filled with (laughs) cassette programs. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, me too. (laughs) So when I was in sales, I was selling semiconductors and I left a job being an engineer to sell semiconductors. And I was sort of bamboozled into the position I was told I had a $2 million territory, but that territory was the scraps that all the other salesmen didn't want. (laughs) So $2 million, but that's before all those clients went out of business. So (laughs) I had basically to start from scratch. And it took me 14 months, Tom, before I got my very first real commission check. Wow. I wanted to reflect on something you said. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, you know, it's the pain of change. It's being uncomfortable. That's the clue that you're on the right path in most cases. So if you're doing something today and you're in your comfort zone and you're not growing and you're not happy with where you are, that's the key, then you need to move forward. You need to find that challenge that's going to make you uncomfortable. So usually, again, when I work with clients, one of the first things I ask them is, what would make you uncomfortable to take the next step? And I had somebody say to me, look, the most uncomfortable thing I could possibly do is get on stage. I said, great, let's start with that. (laughs) And, you know, in 90 days, we had that individual on stage and they were exhilarated by the experience. And 
like you, found it to be something that they now wanted to do more and more of. At this point in the show, Tom, what I'd like to do is ask you if you could help us listeners with the basics and understanding of what it would take to be a great salesperson. So if we have passion about our clients, passion about our field, passion about how what we do changes an individual or a company, but can't quite fill the pipeline, how would we do it? Can you give us some tips? Well, the first thing I come back to is you need to do research in your area to find companies that are looking for people. I think then you need to do your best to find a company that has a manager or a supervisor that you relate to. I was very fortunate. I don't know if I'd have been successful eventually in real estate had I not had a great leading manager who really helped me overcome my fears, helped me to learn the art of selling homes. And so I think that's one of the real keys is if you're going to go through the pain of the change, if you're going to take a risk and you have some capital, then you need to do research to find not only the product or service you totally have passion for, but I think you have to find the people that become mentors. I also believe that if you go to Amazon, there's so many books and CDs, DVDs, and you can get, even if you started with just one and you wore out the darn thing as I did years ago with my cassettes before we had CDs. And this, I think, is the steps you take. And it doesn't happen overnight. I think a person is going to have a long-term success has to realize that the first year can be almost like education to where you're learning the field, you're learning all the antidotes of how to prospect, use a telephone to make the appointments and how to meet people properly, how to qualify them. And if I were to give any advice, I would say work on two things. Work on becoming a better questioner and a better listener, because the real art of selling is the opposite of what most people think. Many people think that it's talking and telling instead of realizing it's really asking and listening. And these are the type of little nuances that I have always taught and believe can be the foundation of success. Because in a communication situation, any conversation, whoever's talking is only learning what they already know. When you're in that situation and you become what I call a master asker, you master asking the right questions and you're listening, you'll learn what you need to know to help people and lead them to say yes to whatever you're offering them. Makes a lot of sense. It's not about talking and telling. It's about asking and listening. That is such such great advice, Tom. And you know, that incidentally can be applied even to the digital world, even to the world that we live in, where most of that relationship is started online and then moved one-on-one only later after people know who you are. So it's only after people respond to something on the internet, click or fill in an email address that, that the beginning of the relationship starts. And these days, that does start with talking and telling, but it usually moves to asking and listening pretty quickly if people want to be successful. So it's a great tip. Where would you go next? Now, you talked a little bit about finding a mentor, finding that passion, finding that field that you love. If you already have the field that you love, if you already have the passion, if you already have a mentor who you're working with, but you know, not working with because many of them are not affordable to many of us starting out, but more along the lines of learning from, what would you say we should do if we're having trouble closing sales? Closing of a sale is an art form that can be learned. And here again, I was so happy when you were telling about my book and so forth, you living with it for your years. But that is an art form that I think makes us as a training company a little different. I've had people in interviews like this. I've had people that have hired us as a company say, what makes your company different than many of the other motivational or sales companies? And I say, well, we primarily teach one subject. And there's basically seven fundamentals into selling anything. And we isolate number six, which is the art of closing a sale. 
And we spend most of our time in that area because I think it's the most misunderstood and most improperly done part of selling for most people in the field of sales. And it is an art form to close a sale properly without having to apply pressure or being overbearing or aggressive. And I think the reason I closed so many sales is I did it in a way that had a lot of empathy for the buyer, a lot of sensitivity to their concerns. And again, as a questioner and listener, I usually found out what they would say yes to by never having to make a lot of statements, but by being an avid listener to their input, which allowed me to qualify as to what properties back in real estate that I would put them in the car and show to them and then close the sale. So that was kind of the way I felt. But I would say that that subject number six of the seven is probably the most important. And it's the one that I have had most fun teaching how to close a sale. And that's the main art form that you get paid for when you are in the field of sales. Absolutely. And if you were to look back and you were to summarize, if you could, all the years that you've been visiting corporations and sales trainings, what would you say are the most common mistakes people make when they try to close a sale but don't? I believe that the biggest mistake is too many salespeople come across too much like a stereotypical salesperson. And they literally come across the way a salesperson does instead of just a good, empathetic, caring listener. And here again, I feel that the big mistake many salespeople make is they haven't got a smooth transition from the presentation step of showing the product, showing the service, and then gently moving in to getting minor agreements. And then from minor agreements, which we would call test closing questions, where you're in essence kind of like a thermometer. You find out how sick a person is or how hot they are by putting a thermometer in their mouth, and then you read it and know where they're at. Well, in a way, by asking questions and listening, those are almost like thermometers that let you know where they are coming from. And then, of course, in test closing, by asking these little questions, you're building what I call the yes momentum to where the yes momentum leads right into where you have the opportunity to move into the final closing of the sale, which it's a beautiful experience. And the people that do it, and they all develop their own closing instinct, Mitch, meaning if I sat down at a table with a husband and wife as an example, you'd see me do a certain things in the art of closing. If you saw another woman, a woman named Virginia Carter, she's passed on, but when she was 93, she was the highest income earning great, great grandmother at age 93. She made over a million dollars a year in financial services. And if you watched her at the desk, she had her own instinct, her own style. So this is something you have to develop and work on because it's imperative that you are you as a person, that you aren't trying to become someone else, but you emulate another person. You say and do what they say. You ask the right questions. And all this is the art form that leads up to closing the sale, getting the check today and having them happy and sending you qualified introductions and referrals in the years ahead. Tom, I want to make sure that I don't have a misunderstanding here. A minute ago, you said to be you. And then I thought I heard you say emulate another person. I wasn't sure what you meant. Well, what I meant by that is you need to find people that you can emulate and you feel good about how they come across. There are people in sales I could not be like because they don't have the warmth that maybe they're over aggressive at times. I think in finding people to not only listen to, take advice from, but let them mentor you, you have to find someone that you kind of relate to as to their temperament, their personality, the way they come across. And I think one of the reasons we've had such a wonderful seminar business is what we teach really relates to almost everyone. It doesn't just relate to the talkative, outgoing salesperson. It also relates to the what we call the inverted type of person who's a little timid, a little shy, and they're more of an introvert and interesting extrovert. So we try to match our stuff 
to all types of people, because I think all of us are in the people business, regardless of what we do. And understanding yourself, others, people, how to come across properly, being a master asker of questions, and a very empathetic listener. Add all this up and you are going to do well in this wonderful profession called selling. Thank you for making that clear. Now I understand exactly what you mean. I've heard Tony Robbins talk about this in the years that he and I worked together. And he uses a word that's similar to what you do. He uses the word modeling. So what he likes to do is find somebody that he believes has what he needs and then model that skill or model that element of that person's personality to best duplicate the success that they've created. Is that what you mean in the same way when you say emulate? Very similar. It can also be called mirroring, which is what some trainers call it. But I remember so vividly, I walked out on a stage in Florida, and it's kind of funny that you brought this up, but I looked out around the room. I maybe had four or 500 folks in the room, and I noticed a guy in the back who I thought, why isn't he sitting down? And I saw him and kept watching him and finally realized he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't standing. And sure enough, he came up at the first break, and he was Tony Robbins. and. This would be back when he was 21 years of age. Hmm. And of course, I've it really had such respect. And, you know, we call Tony the Batman of infomercials because he, he is and has been the king of that communication skill. But he, of course, has wonderful ideas. And none of the things that Tony or myself teach really oppose each other. It's just kind of a different way, a different approach. And I think I've had a little saying. Listen to a person and take the best and leave the rest, because if there's something you don't relate to, don't take it and make it yours. Absolutely. And Tony would agree with that as well. And it's funny because I knew that where you were going when you said I saw that person standing up in the back of the room. <laughs> I just knew it because, you know, I have pictures of Tony and I where he's patting me on the chest and his hand is the width of my shoulders. So <laughs> he's a his big hands man. are huge. Yeah. Yes. Yes, but he's had the gift of being able to inspire and change the state of many people who attend his events. And I highly, highly recommend working with Tony at any level you can. Tom, this, I is, agree. this has been just such an incredible time with you. I actually have to ask you a couple of questions here because I'm fascinated by all of what you've shared and some of the tips today alone could potentially change the trajectory of any of our listeners. So I'm really glad that we had this time together. Let me ask you this question about, really about you. Who in all of space and time would you like to have one hour to enjoy a walk in the park, a quick lunch, or an intense conversation with? Well, if I could go back, even though he's gone to see the Lord, I would consider Ronald Reagan a person who I did meet, but I never had that chance to spend an hour in the park. Another person would be Margaret Thatcher from Great Britain, I think she would be a fabulous one-hour luncheon. There's an awful lot of people. If you had that to say, make a list, I bet I could come up with a lot more that I'd say, what an hour that would be. Sure. And I would just love to have had those experiences. People listening, I hope, will realize that's something you really want to research. Who in this world are people that you would love to take their intelligence their skill, and make it a part of you. I think it's an excellent example of what people should do to continue to personally grow as a human being in all areas of their life. Well, Tom, that's why I asked the question. I like to see who has shaped an individual. And in many cases, this is a great way of getting right to it. And you named some amazing people. And because you're you, I'm going to let you have two people. Usually, I only let people have one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm flattered. <laughs> so now, but, you know, I mean, some people, particularly young people, would not really understand who Margaret Thatcher was. People know Ronald Reagan was a former president of the U.S., but the changes, the sweeping changes both of those people had on our era, on the time that we lived in while those people were in office. So that's what makes them great choices. I really love the folks that you changed. 
if you don't mind, I'd like to come with you when we go sit and talk to these two. If that's okay. <laughs> oh, I'd love to have you join me. <laughs> Great. Okay, cool. I'll see if I can set that up. Okay, buddy. <laughs> okay. So here's the grand finale question, the change the world question. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So what is it that you are doing or would like to do that truly has the potential to literally change the world? Well, let me say it this way. And I have been blessed to have 5 million people. Right now, we just hit over 5 million who've attended my seminars in the last 40 years. And if I were to take the increased income that the folks I feel have gotten from our training, and we put that onto the gross national product as to what the country makes, I think I would be thrilled to say that, hey, we are doing something good for the overall country as to the revenue created, because as you said, nothing happens till someone sells something. And that's why for the average company in this country, that person called salesperson is so critically important to the company to generate revenue. I think that my whole goal would be to teach people in sales throughout the world to do a better job in servicing and serving others, and in serving, thus selling, the whole world gets better, not only economically, but in all areas of our beautiful countries. Tom, that's a great way to change the world, a way that I could sign up for every day of the week. Five million people, my goodness, I mean, that's just such an incredible career, and I'm so blessed to have been one of those people. So thank you for that, for all of the increased income that you gave me as your student many years ago, and also for continuing to do it. I know I would assume that you could have chosen to retire any time these last 10 years or more, but instead have chosen to continue the calling, to continue to be out there sharing and teaching and benefiting others. So true. I have been asked by family and personal friends, you know, why do you still get on a plane every week? And why don't you retire? You don't need to work. Well, I've always had a little saying, retirement can be a fancy name for an early death, because I believe that when a person retires, doesn't have a passion for what they're doing, I believe that they don't live as long. And I feel that, you know, loving what you do and helping others and becoming a servant to your fellow man I think that's what keeps you young and vibrant and physically able to do a lot of things with your life. Absolutely. And if we could fix only one element of that, the hotel food, it would be even better. (laughs) (laughs) I think you're right on. (laughs) Good. Well, Tom, listen, there's so many people who have heard this, who will hear this interview and will want to get in touch with you, want to learn more about seminars. I mean, for heaven's sakes, are you coming to Boston again? Oh, yes. I'll be to Boston sometime, maybe in about eight to nine months. That's, I think, where it's scheduled. But yeah, I'll continue to do that 30 or 40 seminars a month. I mean, a year in Boston. And I've always loved your state. They've been great people. And so hopefully when I do come, you'll know and you'll come by and we'll have lunch. That'd be super. I would love that. And how could people find you on the internet or find the programs that you offer? Well, if they go to TomHopkins.com, I'm here, of course, in Scottsdale, Arizona. And if they go to my website, TomHopkins.com, they can go on and they can find all of our product services, seminar schedule, what cities we're going to be in. And of course, they can also see me on the internet. They can also take advantage of what we do there. My main office is now in Chandler, Arizona. Tom Hopkins International, and they're free to visit us there. Sometimes people call and our customer service people will send them out information on all the stuff we do. So that's nice if you let them know about that. And thanks so much for that. Of course. Well, listeners, this is your opportunity to change your sales trajectory. Today's interview could potentially be the pivot point of your entire life. Don't waste this last 45 minutes. Don't waste the time you spent. Take action. Get in touch. Go to TomHopkins.com. Find a way to, at a minimum, buy his book, 
which changed my world so many years ago, buy the book, How to Master the Art of Selling, and find a way to see Tom and let him inspire you. Tom Hopkins, thank you so much for your time today. It was such a pleasure. And I am going to take you up on that lunch. I will look forward to it. Thank you, Mitch. Okay. All the best, my friend. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to your first thousand clients with your host, Mitch Russo. Go to www.yourfirstthousandclients.com for a free guide on how to get a thousand of your own clients. And if you like this episode, please go to iTunes and subscribe, rate, and review. 